Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and today we have a very special guest joining us live. We have Francis Wapplinger, the bespoke shoemaker, American-based, uh, trained in Italy. And we had him in our studio a few weeks ago, uh, talking through his history, kind of how he trained, where he learned, uh, reviewing some of his samples, and it kind of all culminated in him taking my bespoke measurements. And so uh, after that, of course, uh, we kind of went back to New York. We've had a little bit of time to think about it, and I've decided to go ahead and commission a bespoke pair of shoes uh, from Francis. And it's a really exciting moment here because it's the first time that I'll have had a bespoke pair of shoes made uh, here in the United States, which I have to be honest, uh, is a really big deal considering that that tradition uh, is really rooted in Europe and outside of London, uh, Paris, and Italy. It's really hard to find a bespoke shoemaker. I couldn't be more excited to welcome Francis onto the channel uh, to talk about uh, this next pair of shoes I'm gonna have made. Francis, how are you? Hi, good thanks, how you doing? Yeah, so we've got Francis Wapplinger, of course, bespoke shoemaker, uh, trained in Italy, uh, right, but based here in the United States, uh, right in Brooklyn, am I right? And so you're joining us from your beautiful little workshop uh, right here in the United States where you do your absolutely beautiful bespoke shoes. I am. I'm in uh, the workshops in Gowanus, Brooklyn. Um, so that's where I am tonight. You can see uh, part of the workshop behind me. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, so talk to us a little bit about your setup there. So. Um, you know, I mean, here you are in the United States. I mean, how hard was it to really put together your own kind of bespoke uh, workshop whenever, you know, there's no other bespoke shoemakers here in the United States really to kind of acquire tools from. So how much of this did you have to bring over? Uh, and, you know, just talk to us a little bit about kind of your setup there. So the setup I have, it's a uh, relatively traditional to kind of small Italian work uh, workshop as I train in Italy, which you mentioned. Um, bringing all the tools over, um, while I was studying in Italy, I acquired most of my hand tools uh, while I was there. So I kind of packed those up, threw them in my suitcase, and uh, came back here. Um, but for other uh, tools, some uh, light machinery, sewing machine, skiving machine, uh, that kind of took some research. I wasn't familiar kind of with the distributors here in the States. So it took probably about a year a little bit more kind of to get everything sorted out, have everything I really needed um, to make it a fully functioning workshop. Yeah, but I guess, I mean, you really don't need that much. I mean, that's the beauty of bespoke shoemaking. I mean, I see the sander you have behind you. You've got your small little mm -hmm. workbench, you know, with all of your tools, you know, maybe a table to do your clicking on um, and then a sewing machine. And I mean, is that pretty much it? That's pretty much it. I would add, uh, I have a skiving machine, so that thins out the leather. Um, you know, when you're making patterns, you want the bottom layer to be thinner, top layer to thin that out a little bit just to make a smooth transition uh, when you have those pattern pieces. Yeah. And I was doing that by hand um, for a bit, but the skiving machine, I got, you know, kind of a, a rebuilt one. Um, and that just saves time, you know, and then you can go back in and clean it up uh, manually. Yeah. Well, that's pretty exciting. So, uh, you know, you had a beautiful lineup of samples, you know, and having something made, you know, this is kind of always, I guess, where um, where a client starts, you know, with the bespoke shoe maker is kind of looking at their standard range of samples and then kind of going mm -hmm. from there. I mean, I think part of the challenge of the bespoke shoe making process is that ultimately anything is possible. Uh, but I would imagine that most clients like me maybe lack a little bit of imagination for going too far outside the box and instead kind of revert back to what those classic samples uh, are as kind of a starting point, right? At least from a model perspective. And then, uh, you know, the, la the customer can choose, you know, toe shape, uh, the leather that's used. So you've got some of these samples with you right now. Uh, why don't you just kind of go through uh, kind of what you have and, um, and talk through some of, you know, some of your more classic samples. Sure, so I have a few samples here. Uh, this is one that we looked at um, down in Texas here. Yeah, fairly so this is a black city road. Yep, fairly classic. Um, and this one's nice because even with all the decoration, I mean, it doesn't really pop out as something too funky, too crazy. And you can kind of dress it up or down. Um, you know, if you go with a, a really dark brown or all black. Um, yeah. And we have this pattern. It's a little more simple, but I did it in a museum calf. 
So this or is, is this a simple, leather kind of. That's a an Oxford, so, you know, just a quarter brogue, right? Yeah, exactly. And you know, with the bespoke process, I mean, you can make this. You know, you could add decoration wherever you want. Uh, recently, I had a few guys order basically this, but either uh, with a straight toe cap or just no toe cap at all. So making it even more simple and kind of just clean than it is. And then another one uh, I have back here. This is a take on a saddle shoe. So this one's kind of uh, one of the more kind of funky, crazier designs I have here. I'm trying to get that in focus. There. Yeah, that's an interesting shoe. A little bit uh, more to your left. There you go. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Floating it into in the frame. So, I mean, of yeah. the two samples that you have, I mean, I've got, I mean, I feel like the first shoe that I always want to have made, uh, I just, uh, I, almost as a rule, I say, is like a black cap to Oxford, right? Because it's the, it's the, it's, you know, it's like plain vanilla ice cream. I mean, if you can't do vanilla ice cream well, then, you know, how's everything else going to be? And so that's kind of like the foundation. But I really was struck by that black uh, semi brogue uh, that you have right there. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely beautiful, the detailing. And so I have one yeah. very similar uh, made by uh, Dimitri Gomez in Paris, a beautiful shoe. And so, you know, on something like that, I don't need two black semi brogues. But I was thinking about maybe doing something like that, maybe in a different leather. And, you know, you guys that are watching right now, I mean, most of you have kind of seen you know, my wardrobe. So chime in if you have any suggestions. It would be interesting to see kind of what you guys think. Um, I think we can actually do a poll right here. It's going to be non-binding though. So so there we go. We've got that up. The semi brogues uh, or the cap to Oxford. Um, I think that you have to be a subscriber in order to participate in that poll. But we're going to kind of run that. So let's just say, it, you know, we were going to go with that black semi broker, really any of those. I mean, if I was to do the uh, just the, you know, the quarter brogue with the cap, right? I'd probably do it with the mm -hmm. straight cap without the little, um, you know, the, the peak or the design element that you have in the middle. But, um, you know, what are the leathers in terms of solid leathers? I mean, other than black, right? What, what do you have in kind of the dark brown? You know, what type so, of calf skin would you recommend? Or what do you have? So for someone like yourself, we kind of talked a little bit before this. So I pulled some brown swatches here. I've got kind of your classic, really dark yeah. chocolate brown. Mm -hmm. And I have this one, it's a little bit of a reddish brown, almost like a brick. Yeah. There we go. Uh, this is more of a medium brown here. Yeah. And then a little bit lighter. Yeah, so and that kind of gets into my Foster, Foster and Sons territory right, right there. Um, yeah, and I, we talked a little bit before this. So for someone like yourself, uh, you know, very classic, clean look. Um, I really would stick, you know, with the uh, French box caps. And I think yeah. really it's kind of going, you know, maybe doing a brown instead of a black. Um, you know, someone like yourself, that's probably what I would recommend for the first pair. And I mm -hmm. think what you said about the vanilla ice cream, I mean, you know, with clients, if they come in and they want something crazy for the first pair, you know, I, I usually ask them a little bit more about their selection. Um, and maybe that's really what they want, but I think yeah. it's better to go with something cleaner, classic for the first pair. And then you kind of build off of that. And as you kind of get experience with bespoke orders, um, I know you have experience, then you kind of get more comfortable with uh, kind of picking and you know choosing different things that uh, you might want. And yeah. also something classic, a dark black or, a black or dark brown. I mean, that will go with most everything in a person's yeah. wardrobe. Well, what's nice about dark brown is that you can wear it with gray. I mean, it's really a, a, yes. a, a flexible shoe. I mean, it's not necessarily something that you'd wear in the evening time. Uh, but, um, you know, absolutely beautiful and, um, you know, something that can be used. Uh, you know, the, the polls right here are kind of interesting. We had 53 people vote. 58% uh, of them kind of go for the, uh, the cap to Oxford, that quarter brogue, just with the punched cap. Uh, and then 41% mm -hmm. for the, uh, the semi-brogue. And then some other people are kind of talking about, um, you know, a long wing. 
which I've never really been a fan of um, wingtips, right? So I don't know if I would do a long wing, but um, it's an interesting story. And as far as American shoemaking is concerned, there's no question uh, that long wings are, are very kind of quintessential. Yes, definitely. But when I think of a long wing, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, kind of the ready to wear classic American shoes. And I kind of would, I'm someone like you, you know, I'm similar to you. I'm not big on the long wing. I really like the toe cap. So shoes I make for myself, I usually do different variations on a toe cap. And yeah. that's kind of what I've been drawn to. So that's yeah. why I have, you know, two of those in my samples here. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think we're going to, uh, for Raphael, stay away from another plain black uh, cap to Oxford. But let's look at the museum cap shoe real quick. So if we were to do that right oh. in a dark chocolate brown uh, with a more kind of standard toe cap, right? Kind of walk yeah, like me through some of the other cap. design elements that you have there. And uh, maybe hold yeah, the shoe up so sideways so we can see it. Yeah, Let's there you go. Rotate here. it like that and bring it a little bit to your left. Yeah, that's there we go. Yeah, right kind of perfectly in frame. Maybe tilt it a little bit dust so, so you can see it. Basically, starting off, I'd have you look at the sample model and, uh, you know, kind of talk to you about your style, what you're going to be wearing this with. And, you know, since we've chatted before, I know you're going for a quite classic look. Um, so that first thing we can do is really change this toe cap here, make that straight across. So that's a design element that is completely up to you. Yeah. And then whether you want it, you know, with some broguing, gimping, that's up to you. I mean, we could do it without any decoration, or if you wanted to make this kind of like a semi brogue, you know, we can do broguing, you know, all all on the top line in here. So kind of whatever details you want. <clears throat> yeah. And I've then got the that other mock, element mock uh, semi brogue from uh, Cleverly. But um, so let me see a little bit. What if, what if we did that as opposed, you know, uh, for the pattern pieces as a, um, as an Adelaide, you know, where that vamp piece kind of goes all the way straight back. Right here? No, not that, the, right there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we could make this into an Adelaide. Um, I would say that would really change this uh, particular shoe. I mean, that's something we could definitely do. I would probably make kind of a sketch for you, kind of sketch that out, talk to you about, mm -hmm. you know, with the Adelaide, are we going to making it round? Are we going to do something really angular on the facing? Um, but with the bespoke process, this is kind of a starting point. And if you want to go Adelaide, we can do that. Another thing I would ask to this toe shape, kind of versus that one. I know we're talking about kind of the more rounded toe. Yeah. Well, I think as far as something... a round toe goes, you have a really beautiful round toe shape uh, right there. I mean, not that one. So yeah. that one is a little bit more almond. The uh, uh, This the... one's a little more almond. And then this one's kind of the classic round. So yeah, that's I the other thing I would. Uh, thank you. That's the other thing I would talk to, you know, each individual about. Um, yeah. You know what toe shape they want. Mm -hmm. And I think both these designs on these samples, the toe shape is kind of interchangeable. It won't affect the design too much. Um, whereas some designs, you know, they're really more based kind of around the toe shape. Yeah. Um, or it could change it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, with these, you know, the design's kind of interchangeable. If you want to go more towards Adelaide, either toe shape, in my opinion, would work. And then from there, I would ask the construction, what construction the client wants. Um, this one's your classic kind of hand welted English construction, or also known as Goodyear welt. Um, but this one's by hand. Yeah. Would you put a medallion so, on that shoe on the toe cap? Yeah, we can do that. I can definitely put a medallion on either one. So that's another option. You know, if you want a medallion, no medallion. And then also the other thing is what, what kind of sole treatment you want. If you want like a nice small closed waist here, if you want what decoration, this is kind of my own motif I made. This other shoe, it's just a simple you know, it's black just solid console. black. Yeah. Um, and then also on the bottom, um, if you want your initials right here in the waist of the shoe, 
Yeah, that's and, a lot of uh, options. How do you do the heel? I mean, is this a seamless uh, back heel? This one has a seam in the back. Mm -hmm. And then this one on this model, I did it without a seam. Yeah. Do you have any opinion there in terms of, um, I mean, the seam does add kind of a nice visual, you know, reference point there. Um, mm -hmm. that I think is a beautiful line, uh, even though the shoe could be made uh, by a bespoke artisan without that. Are you kind of six of one, half dozen of another? Do you have a particular opinion? I, on that, I'm kind of, I think it's a toss up. I, I feel like with that's personal preference. Um, what I really don't do is sometimes you'll see kind of like that little half kind of seam down yeah. here. And I'm either going to do a seam that kind of goes all the way up the back or I'll do a seamless. So I think something like that, there's not really a right or wrong way. It's kind of the maker's preference and then also the client's preference. Yeah. And I think each individual, they're drawn to different makers based on those samples. So that's kind of a starting point is you see someone's samples and you're like, whoa, I really like that model and I want that exact model. Well, I like that, and I know how I would kind of change it for my own style or aesthetic. Yeah. So if we did the the, the, the museum, uh, you know, cap toe, just with the broguing, mm -hmm. right? We do that in the dark chocolate brown leather, right? I mean, almost basically black, right? Beautiful yep. kind of uh, formal daytime shoe. You know, the straight uh, a cap, right, with the punching, mm -hmm. right? We would do that. Yep. Uh, kind of across that. And then, um, you know, I don't know. I probably would stay away from any additional punching uh, on the rest of the shoe just to, again, kind of keep it a little bit more towards the formal side of things. Uh, and then I think it would be fun to do that with a seamless back just because, again, you know, on a bespoke sure. shoe, you've got such a sculpted, you know, kind of beautiful silhouette to the back that is distinctly bespoke, right? You only get that clipping there at the heel, you know, really on a bespoke shoe because otherwise it wouldn't fit. 95% of all the people. Um, and then kind of start with that. Uh, you know, as far as the outsole, I mean, since it's on the dark brown side, I'd probably go for just a simple black finish. What do you guys think? And probably, I, you know, I'd probably do a slim waist, but I don't know if I would do a fiddleback waist. I'm, I'm kind of over the whole fiddleback waist fad. I feel like that was a little bit of, of a fad for a while right? Because no one had seen, seen it anymore. Uh, but there's really something to be said about the function of the waist in terms of what that does to create stability in the shoe. And, um, you know, the wider the waist, uh, the more stable the shoe will be. Uh, am I correct? Yeah, I mean, it really, for me, it's about kind of the heel. So that's kind of where you're stepping. Um, and at first, too, like yourself, I was like, whoa, fiddleback waist, like, I mean, it is a beautiful kind of sculptural element, but some things for me personally, I just like closed waist, kind of simple. It's like you get a slight kind of round in there, just like these samples. Um, you yeah. Know. I mean, I think a simple black sole or even a natural sole uh, is uh, there's just an elegance yeah. and the simplicity there that is uh, really quite beautiful. Uh, what about the number of uh, eyelets? I mean, I, Whenever we spoke, you know, kind of on the video, you know, you, you mm -hmm. spoke about how you kind of lean towards six uh, eyelets. Yes. Is that kind of a house uh, hallmark, like kind of a little bit of a uh, trademark? Not trademark, but signature. So it's kind of turning into one, I think. Um, you know, when I was learning, I was doing the five eyelets. That's been pretty classic for a while now. And when I got back here, I was doing that. And when I was looking at a lot of these uh, kind of vintage uh, models that uh, used to be quite popular. It was really six uh, eyelets was uh, kind of the thing. I was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that out. I'm going to make my facings just a touch bigger. Um, and I'm kind of sticking with that now. Um, so, but, you know, if someone doesn't like that, I'm happy, you know, to do five eyelet. You could either space them out a little bit differently on these models. Yeah. And you could do five if you wanted. But I really, I do like the six. And I'm kind of sticking with that for now. Yeah. Um, well, I think I would go with the six eyelets. I mean, that I think is uh, kind of part of your signature. And so, and it's certainly an ode to just your roots in America here as being an American based 
bespoke shoemaker. It is, you know, the six eyelets was distinctly uh, really American, you know, kind of in the early 20th century. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm trying to take, a, you know, my background in Italian training and then kind of uh, mix that with uh, being in the, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one of the nice things where I can find a balance uh, with that yeah. design element. What about, um, what about other options? I mean, is there anything else in terms of kind of just um, things that we would need to sort out in order to kind of get a, an order confirmed and on the books? Yeah, so right now, I mean, I've been taking a few notes here, but uh, I have a little order form checklist I go through. Um, and really, it's the last shape. So that's kind of toe shape, the construction, um, the leather selection. And when you say construction, I mean, how would that change? I mean, you know, I, whenever I think of construction of bespoke shoes, it's all good. It's all yeah. hand welted, right? Hand sewn, outsole. Right. So with the construction, um, this is kind of, uh, I call it a good year, but also it's a uh, called English construction right there. Classic. Um, I am able and I offer a uh, Norwegian constructions. Uh, Norwegian. So we have this here, Norwegian. You can see that. Yeah. What's your upcharge for a Norwegian at Welt? That one, it's uh, 175. That's it. That's amazing. So there is a slight upcharge on that. I'm telling you, Francis is like a bargain, guys. You guys better get in before he uh, gets smart and increases prices dramatically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot no, of uh, spoke shoemakers charge a significant premium for a Norwegian welt. Yeah, to, I believe. Not to push prices up. I don't want to be responsible for that. I know. I let me let me double check that for you. Sorry, one thousand yeah, seven hundred fifty. That's the current. That's the current upcharge uh, for the Norwegian. So there's that. You can do kind of the Norwegian construction. You can do it braided like the one I uh, showed you. You can do without the braid. So you just have single stitches going around. Um, there is uh, the, I could do a hand blake stitch. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of steer away from that, but it is an option for kind of a really lightweight summer shoe. Yeah. And then the other, down my checklist, it's really the upper leather. So with you, we're going yeah. with this really nice kind what of... What type uh, of sock would you use? What type of leather for the sock? The lining. For the for the lining, I just have uh, all my shoes. I do... Uh, it's a vegetable tan. Um, it's kind of natural. Calfskin. Yeah. yeah, it's a cowhide. I shouldn't say calfskin. It's a, it's a cowhide, but it's all leather. And it's this kind of like a neutral color right here. Yeah. Kind of okay, I can see it. And then what about, um, I mean, I probably wouldn't do any tacking on the waist. Um, I'm not a huge fan of toe taps. I don't do that much walking in my shoes. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's not all that necessary. I feel like if you were based in New York or something, then, um, you know, then maybe, you know, you would add toe taps in order to really help kind of protect the, um, you know, kind of the, you know, front of the shoe. Yeah, exactly. And I think, too, some people just how they walk. You know, some people just wear their toes out really fast, and that kind of is what it is. So, you know, if someone comes to me and they say, you know, what is going on? I'm just wearing through right into the welting on the toe line. Yeah. Way quicker than any other part of the heel, you know, or other area in the sole. Then I'd say toe tap. It's not really necessary, but some people just like it too. Um, yeah. So that's another option. So we got the toe tap. Um, then, uh, you know, if you like kind of the classic, uh, rubber treatment on the heel, yeah. kind of that mm-hmm. rubber, it's hard to see, but it's that little yeah, back the, the top piece cap, right here. Or the, what is it called? Not uh, top lift. Yep. Top lift. So I can do like all rubber. I can do the classic kind of dress one where it's like that back kind of yeah, third. I would do just third. the classic one with the, uh, the corner. Yeah. And then there's the toe plate. Then the other option is the nails. On the toe, I do some small kind of tacks right in there. So you can do one row. That's kind of what I start with. You know, if you wanted two rows, then there's, I put a few kind of nails in the heel there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, This is kind of the standard design. I do nothing too crazy. Does the tacking Um, on the toe really make much of a difference? Just in terms of kind of helping to reinforce that, um, you know, the invisible channel stitch? 
or the invisible I mean, you don't, channel. I would say it adds a little bit more wear and tear, um, like protection from wear and tear in the toe. Um, but these small ones I put in, you know, it's a nice little decorative touch in my opinion. Um, it, you know, it's a little bit, adds a little bit of protection. Um, but the heads on these are pretty small, so it's not a yeah. huge difference in wear. I just feel like it's a nice touch. Um, so yeah, nails on the toe, and then the sole color, edge color, um, and then if you want your initials uh, in brass tacks on the bottom. Yeah. Don't have a sample here with that, yeah. but uh, what are you working on right that's now? Not Do you have any shoes you're making at the moment you can show us? Yeah, this pair right here. So I do put a plastic cover, so I have the welt on this pair. So it's kind of hard to see. So there you've got the channel on the inside, right? And then yeah. that's what you sew the welt, which is the rubber thing around the perimeter of the shoe. And that one's got a 360 yeah. welt. I mean, do you always take your welt all the way around, or is that a function of the style of the particular shoe? This is uh, one of the things that... When I was in Italy, a lot of the Italian makers, they will do a 360 welt. Not not everybody. Everyone kind of has their own style, but that's how I learned. And there's a number of makers there that I'm familiar with that do kind of uh, that, where they don't put the rand on. They just do a welt 360. And for me, I kind of like that. Um, I don't think, you know, someone might argue, oh, it's better, you know, to put the rand or not. But that's kind of how I learned. And... The guys I learned from have been doing it forever, so I just kind of stuck with that. And then you can see here, this is uh, the same shoe, but before it's welted. Okay. So let's see the bottom. See so you've what got the like. upper kind of nailed in and kind of tacked, right? Yep. And that's what's holding all of the pieces together, right? The upper, the inner lining, and even the hard countering exactly. uh, to the insole. And then the welt is what basically then sews all those pieces together. Exactly. So the yeah. welt is really what attaches the upper to the insole. And mm -hmm. then when you do the sole stitching, you're attaching the, the welt to the sole. So that's kind of the piece that does hold everything together. I have another pair here where it's kind of mid process. So right here we have the heel that's all closed up. Yeah, beautiful seamless heel. Right yeah. there. So you've uh, you've basically you're in the process of lasting that leather. Can you show us some of the different layers? Like turn it upside down and show us like yeah. the toe cap. So I mean, you've got the toe. You've back. got the hard counter. So we have the toe puff, the leather toe puff there, and I haven't sanded it down, so I was just letting it dry. Um, when when I apply it, I have to wet it, so it kind of takes its shape. And, that and then other once it color, dries. The other beige, like the orange leather, I mean, that's the inner lining. Yes, that's correct. So, yeah, so that's before kind of, and then once I sand this down, kind of shape it. This one's pretty round toe. Um, sand that down. Then I have a paste here, a vegetable paste. And then you pop that down. And then I'll continue lasting that. Yeah. And then once I last this down, then the next step is the welting. And when you're lasting so it down, the, I mean, you're stretching that leather over the last. Yes. Right? Nailing yes. it down. And then you've already got the insole prepared. And that's one of the, you really, I mean, that's the defining characteristic yeah. of a hand welted shoe is that, you know, that, you know, the welting, that process of, sewing the welt on is going directly into the insole as opposed to the hold fast, which is a little leather rib that is otherwise glued to the outsole. Yes. Yeah, so this, oh man, I don't think I have one that has that, but yes, this one, the insole and the hold fast are the same piece. So you take the insole leather and you carve out that hold fast. Yeah. And so that is one of the differences between kind of a handmade shoe and a, a factory-made yeah. shoe. And it makes it more flexible, right? There's less material. It sits lower to the ground, right, because of that, yeah. uh, you know, what would the, the gap in between the insole and the outsoles uh, thinner. Yeah, you can see here there's not, you know, I do fill it with cork a little bit, but 
this all gets trimmed down here, this excess leather. And it's not a huge kind of hole that really needs that much material to fill it. So then the shank goes in back here. Yeah. What type of shank are you using? Cork. Right now I'm using leather. So I use yeah. some soling leather in here. Um, I know other makers, they'll use a metal shank. There's I a can't wood stand shank. metal shanks. It's a recipe for disaster um, going through security at the airport. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Alden still but, insists uh, on using their metal shanks. And it's like one of the reasons I refuse to wear their shoes is because, you know, having like at all but guarantees you have to take your shoes off when you go through the metal detector. Yes. Yeah. And I've played around, you know, I've done some with the metal shank, uh, some with the leather, just a really thick piece of that kind of more rigid soling leather. And I really, I really just like the feel of the leather shank in there. Um, and it does keep the shoe a little bit lighter. Um, believe it or not, that small kind of metal piece, you know, it does add a little bit of weight that you might not think is noticeable. Um, so having had made shoes that have metal or just the leather for myself, you do kind of feel that difference. Really? Yeah. And that's another thing and, that I feel you know, like people don't fully understand about a bespoke pair of shoes is that ultimately at the end of the day, it's a lighter shoe than the ready to wear equivalent. And over time, I mean, you know, even though it's pretty in the big scheme of things, not that significant, the weight difference, uh, it is something that you feel on a bespoke pair of shoes is just how much lighter it is on the foot. Yeah, and I think with the bespoke shoes, a lot of it comes down to those little details. You know, unless you're getting something that is just, you know, like a bright orange alligator that just sticks out that you can't really get unless it's custom. It's really all these little details that kind of add up to this final uh, beautiful, uh, you know, uh, shoe at yeah, the end of the pinnacle. day pinnacle level of craftsmanship. Well, anyone that's watching right now live, if you have any questions for Francis, we can uh, certainly, um, you know, he can see those in the comments. We'll let, we'll let him know what those questions are. Uh, any other, I mean, talk to me a little bit about your offerings from the Atelier for someone maybe that's not familiar with you. I mean, you're largely based in New York. You really don't have much of a trunk show schedule. So, I mean, if someone's interested yeah, in a pair so of shoes, I mean, do they fly up and see you? Yeah, so the best thing to do is send me an email. Let me know where you are. And right now, I'm really doing orders in New York City, in Brooklyn, or the greater New York City area. I don't have a schedule right now for trunk shows. Uh, but if I see a pattern, you know, if I get, let's say, for example, a, you know, a number of people in the Dallas area sending me emails, then I think that would be an opportunity to do something there in Dallas. Or, um, you know, if I'm getting a bunch of emails from guys in Florida... You know, I would look to do there. I'm working on, you know, doing uh, uh, some trunk shows down the road. But really, I'm, I've been really just focused in the New York City area. So many people, even if they don't live in New York City, they do come here to visit a few times a year. Um, so it is kind of a hub, even yeah. for people that are out of town. And if you're not able to travel to New York, I do have a made-to-order option, which I send uh, standard size fittings to you in the mail. Yeah. And those are built on my house last, which is the classic uh, round toe right here. Mm -hmm. And you do shoemaking lessons also? Is that something that you have on your website? I do, yes. Yeah. So I do do one-on-one -on -one lessons um, right now. Uh, I did some, I haven't done them recently. I'm a little bit busy with orders at the moment, but uh, when I do have some free time, you know, I do like to kind of share um, what I do with uh, people that are interested. It's best if, you know, students do have some kind of experience and I offer one, one week courses. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So back to these shoes, I think we've got a lot of these details, you know, really kind of laid out. Um, it's very exciting to kind of get on your book um, and to get something written and, and confirmed. Now, talk to me a little bit about kind of what that process looks like for you. I mean, I know, you know, you've got my last measurements, right? My foot measurements, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be, you know, we, we published that video already, right? Didn't we? Yeah. So yes, that's up I already. You guys can help. watch that. And so you take yeah. those measurements and then, you know, you start working on carving 
you know, what is, you know, where everything really begins. I mean, the last shall be first, as they say at Lob. Uh, and that is, um, you know, you begin working on the bespoke last and then kind of what comes next and what does your kind of customer process look like? Uh, you saw me uh, down in Dallas, uh, people saw a video, I take your measurements. And then based on those measurements, I get kind of my uh, standard house last, standard size last. And then I put those that last up to your measurements. And I'm seeing, do I need to sand it down? Do I build it out? Uh, what am I doing? So starting off, I took a look at your measurements. For my kind of starting point, it looks like you're around a, kind of from the heel to the ball. It's around uh, 42. So I'll start kind of based on that rough size there. And then based on that, I'll either build your last out, something like this, or I'm going to sand it down. And I'm really looking to start uh, where your heel is to the ball of your foot. You know, we can always extend the toe shape, sand it down, make it more round, less round. But it's really that ball, um, the heel to ball measurement. So I'm starting with that. From there, we talk about the design. So based on the design you selected, I'm going to make uh, a fitting shoe for you. So that fitting shoe will be in that pattern that we just talked about, and then it'll be on your last. So then we will do a fitting with a, and those fitting shoes, um, it's just a glue construction. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of quicker, faster turnaround, and it's not the full welted shoe. And then also with the uppers on the fitting shoe, it's gonna be the pattern that you chose, and it's gonna be a very similar leather might not be the same color, but we're still going to use, um, I'm going to see uh, what I have here that is uh, the box calf. And it's not, the for the fitting shoe, the uppers I make, it's not the final uppers. So once those are done, you'll try those shoes on um, and we'll see how they fit. And then yeah. I'll mark the last up and or the shoes and we'll go from there. On average, it's about two fittings um, for clients. Yeah. Okay. And that kind of helps you again, kind of validate the construction of the last uh, and the fit, you know, before you go into making the final pair. Exactly. And I think we talked about this uh, earlier, but I really, you know, I'm looking at the measurements when I'm making the last, adjusting it. I'm always referring to those measurements. Um, and obviously if, you know, the first fitting, if you put your foot in and it's just perfect, you know, that's wonderful. But realistically, it's one to two fittings, yeah. you know, because you don't, you can't see everything and have that feel of, you know, what it really feels like on your foot until you get those fitting shoes on. And then once the fitting shoes are on, it just gives you more information, um, you know, about any minor adjustments or just kind of really narrowing in on how your foot is moving in the shoe. You know, how soon do you think it would be, you know, I guess how soon on average until your first fitting? Usually it's about, right now it's about four months or so. Um, okay. So I've been, uh, so right now, I've, you know, for a new customer, for that final, uh, you know, the final shoe, it's, right now it's around nine to 10 months. Yeah. Which is pretty reasonable. I mean, I think most of the bespoke makers in the UK, you know, you're kind of on a year cycle. Yeah. The amount of time it takes to really get it kind of out and completed. And some sometimes too, it depends, you know, if you live in New York City and your fitting is done, I contact you, hey, fitting's done. You're like, all right, I'm, I'm, can I do it tomorrow? Sure. Then the process, you know, you're going to be hitting, you know, kind of the, you know, eight, nine months, like right on the dot. I do have, you know, sometimes people's fittings are ready and they're so busy or they're out of town that they can't see me until a month or two down the road. Mm -hmm. So then something like that will kind of push the time back. But I really try to work with the clients and, you know, if they're not available, that's fine. If they are available, then I'll try to get them in as soon as that uh, fitting shoe's done. Yeah. Well, great. Well, that's super exciting. Can't wait to kind of get this one in the works. It'll be my first pair of shoes bespoke pair of shoes from America. 
So that's exciting to kind of uh, support American craft uh, and craftsmanship. And so uh, anyone that's watching, of course, uh, you can um, you can check out uh, our videos that we've uh, filmed with Francis. You can check out his Instagram uh, and then, of course, uh, his website. Uh, all those links are in the description of the other videos that we filmed with him, uh, and you can find it there. Um, and uh, Francis, you know, thank you so much for kind of joining us uh, on this evening. And uh, it was uh, certainly a privilege to welcome you into our office here in Dallas and to have you show us your work. Uh, thank you for doing that. And uh, great. Well, let me know if there's any other kind of questions you want to follow up on uh, later. But uh, otherwise, you know, get to work. Hopefully these will be turned around faster than my Lee Miller boots, which are pushing four years. <laughs> Yes, well, thank you so much for having me, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this project. So there we go. Uh, Francis Wapplinger, uh, exceptionally talented, based here in the United States in Brooklyn, uh, doing work of the highest caliber. Uh, so I'm exceptionally excited to get these shoes in the works uh, and really kind of formalize the beginning there. You saw it live right there as we kind of talked through uh, the process. We had some people uh, in live chat that kind of chimed in on their opinions. Uh, and so uh, it really kind of changed the direction we were going. I was kind of leaning a little bit towards the austerity brogues, but we're ending up uh, just doing that simple uh, cap to Oxford with the broguing on the cap and a dark chocolate brown leather. I uh, couldn't be more excited about that. It's a shoe that is not represented in my wardrobe. Uh, and so we're going to have Francis uh, get started on making that. Of course, we will uh, film the entire process uh, so that you can join us along uh, as those are being made. Uh, and uh, I'm just really excited about that cause for celebration. Let me know what you think about this video. Uh, of course, give us a thumbs up. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments section below. Uh, otherwise, I'm Kirby Allison. And I love to help the well-dressed acquire and care for their wardrobes while exploring the world of quality craftsmanship and tradition. Thank you for watching.